Dear brothers and sisters, if I were to ask you to name all the instances you know in the Bible related to people and animals, I wonder how many you can come up with. We had a short study in our family last week and I asked my wife and son how many they were able to remember and immediately they came up with a few. And uh, later on that Sunday, coming Sunday, I asked the congregation about all the instances they can remember and, and we had about uh, almost about 10 to 12 instances they were able to remember. Well, these are specific incidents in the Bible in which there was an interaction of people with animals and birds and uh, living things. Not all the references in the Bible about uh, animals. We are not taking even the mention of animals in the parables or prophecies or symbols, but real, actual incidents recorded in the Bible. And if you want to check yourself, you can pause this video and uh, write down how many you can remember and uh, you will be able to know how much uh, you remember uh, of the things in the Bible. Anyway, today we will see 25 remarkable incidents of uh, people and animals in the Bible. And we are doing this because there are spiritual lessons for us uh, Christians in all these uh, instances. So if we were to start this in the chronological order, we begin with uh, in the book of Genesis. We all know in the book of Genesis, uh, there was a particular conversation that took place that changed the destiny of mankind. And that we see in the third chapter, the book of Genesis. Chapter 3, verses 1 onwards, and I'll read to you from the King James uh, Bible. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the women, Yah, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now this is the beautiful situation in which Adam and Eve are in the garden of Eden, which God created for them. And they both are enjoying their life. And, uh, and at that time, the serpent came and opened a conversation with Mother Eve. And that was regarding what they could eat in the garden. So the serpent is talking here, talking serpent. And that itself is very remarkable. When we read about this instance of a serpent talking, we wonder how it can talk. We do not know how the serpent was before this incident happened. Because after the serpent did what he did here in this uh, chapter, God cursed the serpent and changed the very form of the serpent so that it became what it is today and it was cursed to crawl on the ground and uh, eat the dust of the ground. And so we do not know how it was before the curse. Maybe it, it could talk. But at the same time, we should remember one thing. There was a big difference between animals and people in the Bible. We read about all the beasts that God created. God said, let the earth bring forth animals and the sea bring forth fishes and, and let there be birds and all. But when it comes to man, we see very clearly God saying, let us make man in our own image. So man is in the image of God and man is superior to all the beasts of the field. That much we must remember. And according to science today, the most intelligent creature next to man is the chimpanzee. The chimpanzee comes closest to man in terms of intelligence. But there is a huge gap between chimpanzee and man. The cleverest and the most intelligent chimpanzee is far beyond the dumbest man. So, there's a big difference. 
Now, when we see here the serpent talking and questioning women, and in fact, if you go down and see, uh, the serpent actually succeeds in convincing the women to disobey God, we wonder how much intelligence it could have to do such a thing, to be able to deceive someone who was far superior in knowledge and in, in every way. Now, even if it had to do that, what would be the purpose of deceiving Eve? There would be no purpose of the serpent uh, trying to deceive them and make them do what God asked them not to do. And here in the serpent in making them do it, it's obvious that it knew about God's law and, and, and all that. So we can't expect that a serpent, a creature, a lesser creature than man could be able to do all this. Of course, we should remember that in the Bible when we read the serpent doing these things, we know that there was Satan behind this. Satan had already turned against God and he had rebelled against God and here he was trying to make man to rebel against God. And we understand that Satan was behind all this temptation. We read in the book of Revelation chapter 20 about the devil and he is called the, the old serpent. So from that we know that it was the devil's work and serpent was merely a tool in the hands of the devil who really wanted man to sin against God. So that we have to remember. Because talking is not that the serpent should have the vocal cords to be able to speak, but it, it involves thinking, intelligence and, and knowledge of the situation and overall a purpose to, to what he did. And all that we can't attribute to the just the serpent. Anyway, uh, keeping that in mind that the devil was using the serpent as a tool, we can now go back to the instance and read what happened. In verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So we see women responding to the serpent. This itself shows that this was a common thing. This was not the first time the serpent was speaking because uh, if it was the first time women would be alarmed by this and uh, you know, she would be very careful in, in, in her response. But anyway, uh, in, the, uh, in verse 4 we have the first uh, lie that the serpent said to the women. And the serpent said unto the women, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now that is the first lie. The first question came from the serpent. And then the first lie. And clearly and openly, the serpent said the opposite of what God had said. The serpent said, you will surely not die. God had said, you will surely die. Now the serpent is... Assuring her, you will surely not die. Your eyes will be open. You will become like God himself. So that was the lie of the serpent. And then what happened? What did the women do? In verse 6. And when the women saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So what she did, she looked at the tree. Now actually, tree means the fruit of the tree, particular tree, which God had forbidden them to eat or touch. So there, she started looking at the fruit, and it was so attractive, and, uh, and she wanted to become wise and like God, and uh, she decided to take and eat of it. And then we read that she gave it to her husband, that is, uh, and she gave it to her husband, and he also ate. Now, so we know what happened thereafter. We know that their eyes were open to realize their own mistake, their shame, and they hid themselves and 
later on God came and they were not willing to come before God and because they had sinned against God and later on we know the curse. The curse, God started with a serpent and he cursed it to crawl on the ground and until its head will be crushed and, and to the women was given the curse of uh, being subjected to man all her life and uh, the pain that she has to undergo during childbirth and, and then to Adam. And we all know about the curse that he was cursed to earn the bread with the sweat of his brow and, and until he will return to the dust from which he was taken. That is, death would come upon them. Now, we know we have been suffering the result of uh, this disobedience till today. And all the curse and suffering and weakness and sorrow is all because of the disobedience. And it all started with an interaction that Mother Eve had with a serpent. So what we can learn from this, brothers and sisters, is that uh, very clearly when God asks us not to do something, we should not keep thinking about it. We should not hesitate to obey God. If God says no, then it is no. The moment we realize that it is against God's word, we should abstain from it and we should not give much thought about it. In the sense of thinking what will happen if we do it. We just normally, we just think about it. You know? We just, we, we, we say, Oh, let me just think about it. What, how will it be if I did this thing? What will be the pleasures I will enjoy? How nice it will be if there is no law and if I was able to do whatever I like, if I was able to do this thing. And like that we keep thinking and then we fall prey to it. And that's what Mother Eve did. The moment the serpent raised this question, she should have rejected it and she should have left the place and, and stopped thinking about it. But on the contrary, she began to think about it. She began to look at the fruit. She began to open her ears to the serpent's suggestions and, and maybe dream about it and, and wonder about it and think of becoming wise and becoming like God and so on and so forth. And in that way she got deceived. So, brothers and sisters, whenever Satan brings a temptation to us to sin against God, the more we hesitate to reject that suggestion, the more likely that we will fall to it. The sooner we reject the temptation, the better we are. We will be able to overcome it if we stop thinking about it. But here, Mother Eve, had a conversation. She began to think about the suggestions and she began to look at the fruit and how attractive it was and how it will make a wise and so on and so forth. So that is the main lesson to us. We all battle with the same situation every single day in our life. Satan keeps bringing temptations to us to do things against God. And we know that God has asked us not to do such a thing. But Satan will bring suggestions, will make those things attractive. And that is when we should remember God's word. Resist the devil and it will flee from you. The moment the temptation comes, we have to resist it. We have to reject it. Stop thinking about it. We have to understand that whatever God says is for our good. And however pleasurable it might be, ultimately it's not going to be good for us. So the moment the temptation comes, we should refuse to go any further in thinking uh, in, in disobeying God, but rather immediately reject that, and that will be the safest course. Well, there is a lot more to talk about that very instance, but we have to move on. And uh, as you see in the book of Genesis itself, we have another instance, and that we see in chapter 8 of Genesis. You know, in chapter 8, God saved Noah from the great floods that we see right from uh, chapter 6, if you read on, 
how the mankind had become so corrupt and God decided to destroy the whole world. God asked Noah to build a ship and, uh, and in that ship all the animals were taken in pairs of two and seven, clean and unclean. And then it began to rain. For 40 days and 40 nights it began to rain until the whole world was uh, submerged in water. And, and the ship was sailing on top of the water. And uh, at the end of these 40 days and 40 nights, uh, you know, water stopped, you know, stopped raining. But Noah couldn't come out because the water was so much, it had covered the mountains, so he had to wait. And I wonder if you know how long Noah had to stay in the ark before he could step out of the ark. We all know that 40 days and 40 nights it rained, but he could not get out immediately. And in, if you read in chapter 9, we can find out that. He had to stay inside the ark for one year and 10 days. Can you imagine that? One full year. He had to be inside the ark before he could get out into the, into the second world that we, we are all living in. So what did he do? How did he understand when to get out? You know, and that we will see in Genesis chapter 8, reading from verses 7 to 12. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. So first what he did is he left out a raven and it flew out of the ark. It was flying here and there and it did not have any place to rest. So that is what the Noah understood that waters are still there prevailing on the land. Now it says raven here and uh, some have it as crow. In some of our Indian languages it is given as crow. Now there is a difference between a raven and a crow. And very slight difference, you know, like the difference there is between a mouse and a rat. Now, how many of us know the difference between a mouse and a rat? But there is difference, you know. If you see, you know, they say, look at the face, it's different. Look at the tail, it's different, and so on. But when you come across a mouse or a rat, immediately you start running away from it. You don't have the courage to stand and compare and, and know all the difference. Anyway this crow which is so common which we are used to in India is not the one mentioned here. The raven is a bigger bird and its beak is different and the way it uh, makes sound also is different and the tail also is different and and, and slight difference in that uh, dark color also. And anyway, uh, the raven was first let out but he couldn't make any, come to any conclusion based on that other than to know that water was still everywhere. And in verse 8 we read, Also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the water were abated of the face of the ground. So he let out a dove to know if the water had come down. But the dove found no rest to the sole of her feet and returned to him into the ark for the water was on the face of the whole earth and he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into the ark. And the difference is he first left the, the raven and it did not come back to him but it was still hovering here and there. But the dog came back to him so he put it back in the ark. Verse 10, and he stayed at other seven days and again he set forth the dove out of the ark and the dove came back to him in the evening and lo in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. So after seven days when he let out the dough, it came back having in its mouth an olive leaf in the mouth. Now an olive leaf from that time became a symbol of peace because the moment he saw the dog coming back and there's a leaf in its mouth, he found peace. He was happy that the waters have gone down and that now he can step out of the ark at God's word. 
So we see, brothers and sisters, what we can learn from this uh, instance. First of all, we should realize that it was not an easy thing for Noah to stay inside the ark for such a long time. Imagine living in an ark full of animals, of all the animals in the world. Some were two pairs and some were seven pairs, all together in one ark, and here and his family had to live amidst all these animals. Now imagine the smell and the discomfort and, and all that they faced inside that for one year and ten days. But at the same time, we should remember that their lives were spared. They should have been happy. Though that it was uncomfortable and very difficult to stay in the ark, yet realizing that they were the only ones to be saved and the whole world was destroyed, must have really given them a lot of uh, comfort and joy. So what we can learn from that is that we Christians are also in the ark. As we read in, in, in the book of Peter, that baptism does save us. When we come into Christ through baptism, we are into the ark of Christ. Just as Noah was saved in the ark, baptism does now save us. So by us coming into Christ, we are like coming into an ark. So being with Christ and in Christ in this world is very difficult. Because the way that we walk is narrow way. The world is on the broad way doing what they like. Like the people in Noah's days. They did whatever they wanted to do. But Noah was here obeying God and, and toiling and building the sheep and, and in believing in God. So like that, the Christians today are also locked up in, in, within God's will. And now they want to do God's will. They want to obey God. And, and it's not easy to do this in, in a world that has walked away from God. People everywhere are doing whatever they like. And, but a Christian can't do that. Now it's difficult and his life also is hard. God has not promised us so many luxuries, but our basic needs are provided for. And then God will be testing us and difficult times we have to face in order to prepare us. So often it is difficult for Christians. When we look at the world as in the psalmist says, he envied the wicked. He saw them and how happy they were and, and uh, he went on to the extent of missing his step. But then he realized one thing, that God has put them in slippery places. And so we also realize that this whole world is reserved unto fire, but God is going to save our lives. That is what we have to realize. However uncomfortable and, and sometimes boring this narrow work of life of a Christian is, yet our lives are being spared brothers and sisters. God is protecting us and that we should remember. And also remember that one day we will get out of this. We will step into God's kingdom. But till then we have to be content and, and like Noah remember how fortunate we are that God has called us and saved us in this time. And secondly, what we can learn from the crow and the dove is that so many things that we try to do, it may not work, but still we have to do that. Like he left out the raven, he couldn't find out anything and it went off and it never came back to him. He didn't serve the purpose, but yet he had to do that in order to know that it won't work. Oftentimes I remember, we do so many things that won't work, but by Doing it, we find out one way it won't work so that we will not depend on it, so that we will not do that mistake. As Thomas uh, uh, Edison said, you know, he failed some thousand times, I believe. Failed uh, uh, in his attempts to make uh, the electric bulb. But he did think all of the thousand uh, times he tried was a failure. He said, I now know that thousand ways it won't work. So like that, so often we get suggestions from people, do this, do that, and we think about it. And we may think that it's all a waste of time, but it's really not a waste of time. Because all that will help us realize what we should not do, and, and it will point us to the one thing that we should do. It will guide us to the right thing. So by doing all these things. So 
that's what we can learn from this um, instance. And then later on he left the dough went. And finally when the dough came back with that olive leaf, how happy he should have been. He must have been so happy, he called all his children and his wife and told them, see the olive leaf. Now what has gone down? Now there are trees again and we can go out. And what a wonderful sight it was for Noah. And likewise we too, brothers and sisters, as we are in Christ and as we are being prepared, at the same time we are waiting for a doubt to come back. A doubt that is our Lord Jesus himself, the Prince of Peace, coming back with olive leaf to make peace, to bring peace on earth, to establish his kingdom and to change us and to take us to be with him. That is what we are all anticipating and eagerly waiting for. However difficult our situation may be right now, yet we have that hope. We are waiting for him to come back. And one day he will come back. The other day, my wife was on the terrace and I and my son were on the lower floor. And, and sometimes she will call us and she was calling us loudly, come, come up here. And at that moment I, I felt, what if she was able to see our Lord coming back. And I thought, just imagine, you know, suddenly she sees and the Lord coming back with the hosts of angels and she sees that light and all that. And how thrilled and excited she'll be, how she will call us, how she'll scream and call and shout and tell us, come up, our Lord has returned. How wonderful that day will be. And the Lord really indeed comes back for us. How happy we'll be to meet our Lord, the King of Kings, who returns to take control of this whole world, to, to make all things right. We are all waiting for that day. That day will truly come. As truly as he went, so truly he will come back. And we will be united with him. So let us uh, have that hope. And let us wait eagerly for that day. Well, what would be the next uh, instance? remarkable event that we can see related to human beings and um, an animal. Well, we see that in Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, brothers and sisters, we all know that is the most famous chapter in which Abraham offered up his own son Isaac to God. Well, he was ready to do that. God wanted to test Abraham and, and uh, that is, uh, you know, after chapter 21 where Ishmael was sent out. You see, Ishmael was there before him and then Isaac was born and Isaac grew up and, and there was a conflict and Ishmael was sent out and then only Isaac was there. We do not know how much time has gone after that, but no, only Isaac was there and you know, one day God wanted to test him and and of course, God didn't tell that it's a test. Abraham never knew that it was simply a test, but he really thought God was asking him to do that. And God said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, and offer him as a burnt sacrifice to me. Now imagine how Abraham must have felt at that. You know, his only son, he waited 25 years for that son. All his future hopes was on that son. How much he loved that son Isaac. And through him, all the promises that God made to him was to be carried out. But God now is asking Abraham to sacrifice that very son. No, he didn't understand what was the purpose of it, but he was willing to do what God said. Now that is a beautiful scene we see in the 22nd chapter. And Isaac and Abraham alone going on top of the mountain carrying the firewood. And uh, Isaac asked him, here we have the firewood, we have the fire, but where is the sacrifice? Where is the animal for the sacrifice? And then Abraham, the, the father of faith that he is, he spontaneously immediately said, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. <laughs> he said that. And then finally when they were up and they laid the altar and set all the firewood and all that, 
and Abraham caught hold of Isaac and tied him up and he was about to sacrifice him. That's when the angel of the Lord stopped him and he said, don't harm your son because now I know how much you fear me. You see, that was a wonderful passage that we just read that one or two verses in chapter 22. I'll read from, yeah, verse 10. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not held thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there was a ram caught up in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him as burnt sacrifice instead of his son, and called that place Jehovah Jireh. As to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. So, brothers and sisters, that is what we are talking about here. Now, he was about to slay his son, and the angel of the Lord stopped him. Don't harm his son. But he came to give a sacrifice, to give a burnt offering. What will he do? No, he has set up the altar, everything. Now, he has to offer that sacrifice. And so, God provides him with an animal to sacrifice. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. You know, the ram has got this spiral horns. Sometimes it gets hooked in a branch or a thorn or a bush in which it can free itself. Like that, there was a ram. And Abraham knew immediately that that was the sacrifice. And by that time, Abraham had proved to God, how much he feared God and how much he loved God above Isaac. And God was so pleased to him and he swore an oath and said how God will bless Abraham and his seed and how God will bless the whole world through his seed. And that we see uh, in the passage down below. So this ram was provided by God. Ram instead of Isaac. So he takes that ram and gives ram as a sacrifice in place of his own son. So, when Abraham did this, we read in the book of Hebrews, that Abraham believed that even if he were to give his son as a burnt offering, he believed that God was able to raise him back from the very ashes. That's how much faith he had in God. You see, he not only believed in the power of God to be able to bring back his son, but also that God would have that intention to give him back. See how much we can learn from this instance. So basically, about uh, Abraham and Ram, what we can learn from this is that our God is very faithful. But still, at times he will test us. The test that came to Abraham was very, very severe. It's a very difficult test. Can you imagine that? Can you and I do that actually if God should ask us? It's very difficult to sacrifice someone we love in that way. Of course, we are not used to this giving of sacrifice and all, but God does ask us to give up so many things. We have to give up our life. The Lord said, unless you are willing to hate everyone and hate yourself and love me more than all, you cannot be my follower. So we have to sacrifice all that we love. We are called upon to do that, you know. And uh, so when we face situations like this, it's very difficult. But that is how it should be. God will test us to see whether we really fear him, whether we really are willing to give up anything or everything for him. And that test sometimes may include losing someone we love. It's very difficult. Losing somebody whom we love is very, very difficult to understand how God could permit this thing to happen. But yet, we have to understand that God is testing us. His whole life is a test. Just like Abraham did not know, 
that last minute he will come and stop that sacrifice. Abraham did not have a clue. He really thought he had to give up Isaac as a burnt offering. So we will not know what is the purpose God is permitting all these trials and difficulties in our life. Yet we should trust God that whatever God does is for our good and God will not unnecessarily put us into any kind of affliction or trial unless it is for our good. So that is what we can learn from this and, and of course the main lesson is that uh, here is that God will provide the alternative, the substitute. The whole picture here is that uh, of God himself, God's sacrifice. Abraham here pictures our heavenly father and Isaac pictures our Lord Jesus, the son of God, whom God sacrificed on the cross in order to save mankind. So God stopped Abraham in the last minute, but God didn't stop himself from giving his son to die on the cross. Even when the son was crying to his father, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Yet God was willing to forsake our Lord to die on the cross in order to save mankind. Now, Jesus Christ became the substitute, just like this ram became the substitute. Instead of Isaac, it was killed. So, instead of our father Adam, who sinned and brought curse upon all mankind, God sent his son to die instead of Adam, in place of Adam, without sinning, to offer his life to God as a sacrifice. So that Adam and his entire posterity can be saved from death and curse. And that is the wonderful thing that was achieved on the cross. Jesus himself is figured here in Isaac. Abraham, we see his heavenly father giving his only son as a sacrifice in order to save mankind. That is the picture we see here. And incidentally, of course, when our Lord was hanging on the cross, just like the ram caught in the thicket, in the thorns, our Lord was crowned with a crown of thorns. And he was nailed and hanging on a wooden cross, just like this lamp. How beautiful a picture this is of great sacrifice that our Lord gave on the cross. Now, following this is another incident. This involves a camel. Now, we all know the story of Rebecca giving water to the camels. Well, this instance we read in the uh, 24th chapter in Genesis. And Abraham, he was becoming old and Isaac had become a young man now. And Abraham wanted to, to find a, a suitable wife for his son Isaac. And therefore he calls Eliezer, his trusted servant, and he sends Eliezer to go to the far off land, his own country, and to get a bride from his own tribe. And so Eliezer goes on ten camels. Now, he will not go alone on one camel. One camel would have been enough, but he takes a train of camels. Why? Because to, you know, they have to give a good impression. The people should be willing to send their girl because they should know that he is a great man. So he takes ten camels with so many good things to offer and he goes on a long journey and when he comes to that very place he knows how difficult a task it was before him. He had to select a wife that is very correct for his master's son. Now how will he decide, how will he know which girl is the perfect girl for him? Now this is a very very difficult matter. Now so many young people facing the situation they do not know. According to the Bible, they know that they should marry in the Lord, but who? If they have a choice, if they have two or three choices, or just even two choices, now how will they know which is the best, the most important decision it would be? And so many parents have been praying and uh, you know are in the same situation like Eliezer. Who would be the right girl for their son or the right boy for their daughter? So what Eliezer does is, is very good example for us. And Eliezer 
what he does here is we read that in verse 11 onwards we read and he made his camels to kneel down from 24th chapter verse 11 and he made his camels to kneel down without outside the city by a well of water so there was a well there and uh, all the women were coming to draw water and he said O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray to thee. Now he's praying to Jehovah, the God of his master. And he says, send me a good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel, damsel means the girl, to whom I shall say, let down the pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. And she should say, drink and I will give to thy camels drink also. Let the same be that whom thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby I shall know that thou hast shown kindness to the master. So in those days, uh, he asked God to show them a clear sign. Now he prays to God and, he, and, and then he waits there. Now how big a lesson this is for all of us here. Okay, so he prays, all the girls are coming to draw water from the well and I will ask them water. I don't know how long he stood there and uh, how much water he drank <laughs> is it before you know, the right girl came. Brothers and sisters, most of the girls, you know, uh, if you ask water, they may say, okay, take water and they'll go their way. Some may even refuse to give water, you know, because those days it was not just like uh, they had running tap, you know, tap water, so easily they can get water. They had to draw water from the, with a pitcher, you know, water will be somewhere and they had to draw it up, lift it up, and it involved a lot of work. So, not many would have obliged. You know, even our Lord's uh, case we read, uh, when he asked water to the Samaritan woman, she didn't just give water and go. She asked about his race and, and, and so many things, isn't it? So, uh, many girls would have rejected water and most of them would have given water and gone their way. But finally, Rebecca came. And now what happened? And it came to pass before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebecca came out who was born of Bethuel, son of Milka, the wife of Nahor, Abram's brother, with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now, Rebecca walking. Now, this is a real story. There is so much drama here, but this is all real. And the damsel was very fair to look upon and a virgin. Neither had known any man. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. So, it was like you had to go down and get water and come up. So that, uh, that was some work there. And verse 17, And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water from thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my Lord. And she hasted and let down the pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. In verse 19, And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. No wonder that. Ten camels. Even just a donkey will drink one pitcher easily. One bucket water it will drink. A cow will also drink so much water. Now camel, it drinks water after a long time. It's been traveling for, I don't know, maybe a month or more. So how thirsty they will be. And now ten camels and, and how many pitchers of water she had to draw. And she was willing to do that and she gave drink to all the camels. And uh, the man was wondering at her and held his peace uh, to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass as the camels had done drinking that the man took out a golden earring and two bracelets of gold and he put it on her. 
There you see, finally had the God's answer. I was waiting and when she responded like that, how wonderful here it is. The Rebecca was not only willing to give water to the man because he was thirsty, she gave water to the camels also. She did more than what she was asked for. She had a very beautiful heart, just as she was beautiful to look at. And immediately the man was so happy that he began to give her all the jewels that he had brought for her. The golden bracelet and the golden earrings and all that. And then he went to her house and later on she became the wife of Isaac, Abraham's son. What a great privilege it is to be Isaac's son, the son of Abraham, the great man of God. And not only that, above all this, she became the mother of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Through him, uh, Jacob was born, and through Jacob, David's family, and, and Mary, and our Lord himself was born. So what a privilege she got just for offering water. Just because she was willing to quench the thirst of a thirsty man and these camels. So there you see the link, Rebecca and the camels. Her love for the camels. You see, her concern and care for the camels. That changed her destiny. So, brothers and sisters, now what we can learn from this, apart from knowing that we have to be willing to help others, not only to do what is we are obliged to do, to, but to go to the, do the, more, walk the extra mile, you see, as our Lord taught us to do. You see, go beyond what is expected of us. You see, that, that shows uh, really what a beautiful character here we have in Rebecca. She had to become the wife of Isaac, who was in a, from a big family. There were 318 servants in Abraham's house. And to be the daughter-in-law of such a great man, she had to have a big heart and, uh, and, and she was the right one. So, brothers and sisters, what we can learn from this instant is, first of all, from Eliezer, how we have to pray. We have to pray before doing everything, but especially in taking most important decisions like choosing a life partner. We cannot do this in haste. We cannot follow our own feelings, our looks, or anybody's suggestions just like that. We have to pray for God's guidance. Now, how many times I have seen that young people were so careful about everything. They are careful about their job and, and so many things, that business transactions they do, they are very careful. Uh, even about buying a vehicle, maybe a two-wheeler car or or so many other things, they ask people, they search the net, what is the best, and they do the right thing. But when it comes to marriage, so many people are hasty. Do they just fall in love and then get married? And how many cases we see that? So very soon in their life, they realize that they did a wrong choice. Because marriage is something which is so important. This decision will be with you all your life. It will affect all the rest of your life. So we need to pray. And even in my case, you know, I always look at my wife even now, 27 years after marriage, and I keep thanking God. What the beautiful and dutiful wife that God gave to me. Godly wife. I, I always thank God, even 27 years after my marriage. And that is what will happen if we pray to God and if we put God before taking decisions, brothers and sisters. And at the same time, we have to learn other things here. And what is it that we can learn? We can learn that Rebecca here also is a beautiful type. Just as Isaac was a foreshadow of our Lord Jesus, Abraham is a foreshadow of our Heavenly Father. And Isaac is his son. Now a wife for Isaac represents the church. The church is the Rebecca class that God is selecting right from the time of the apostles till now. And just like Abraham sent Eliezer to select a girl for his son Isaac, God sent his Holy Spirit 
And for 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit is selecting a class of people who are like Rebecca. Now, Rebecca was a very peculiar woman, not like every other woman. She had such a loving heart. God is seeing that. God is selecting such people. And she loved the camels. Now, camels, it represents God's ten truths that he sent. The Holy Spirit comes to us on camels, means on these truths, great truths. And, and Rebecca loved those truths. So like that, we should love God's word. We should have a thirst for God's word. And that is what will make us suitable for our Lord Jesus. So just as Isaac was waiting for Rebecca to come back, our Lord is waiting for the church to be complete so that he can come back and, and take her to himself. So what a beautiful picture here we have and that we are called to be Rebecca, to be united with Jesus in ruling this world in the next age. Anyway, that is what we see from this instance. And then following that, of course, we have the tabernacle setup in which so many bulls and goats were involved. That was very important. Now we see this as in general way, not particular animal, but uh, animals and, and real people were involved in this. There's so many instances in which animals were so important. In those days, to make atonement for their sin, they had to bring an animal. To give a thanks offering, they, they needed an animal. For everything, they had to, to give a sacrifice. We see that even from the very first family, from Abel offered a, a sacrifice. And so on, later on in the law, God required the people of Israel to give sacrifices of animals. And we forgot for various requests and, and all the and the bulls and goats were slaughtered and burnt offerings were given in those days. So how important animals were in those days. So, but all these things were only a shadow, a forefigure of the great sacrifice which our Lord himself gave. So that's what we see in all the sacrifices. We see Christ's sacrifice there. Because God really did not have any desire for these animal sacrifices. They were intended to be as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. They were just pointing out to the great sacrifice which uh, Jesus Christ gave on the cross. That we see in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 3 to 10. I'll read from one. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers perfect. They could never make those who gave the uh, sacrifice perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered because the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins but those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. They had to keep continuing because uh, they did not make them perfect. For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It was not at all possible for the blood of bulls and goats, the sacrifice of all these animals, to actually to take away sin. It was only done in a type. That's all. It was reckoned but not actual. And verse 5, Therefore, when he cometh into the world, now when he means it is the real sacrifice of the Lord, he has said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. There our Lord Jesus. He was born as a human being. And he grew up to be a full grown man. And that his body, God had prepared him to be a ransom sacrifice to save Adam's race. Verse 6, In burnt offering and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of book it is written of me. Now, of whom it is written? It is all written of the Messiah. To do thy will, O God. Verse 8, About when he said, Sacrifices and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldst not. 
neither has pleasure there therein which are offered by the lord then said he lo i come to do thy will o god he take away the first that he may establish uh, the second by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of jesus christ once and for all so all the animals were for shadow of this one sacrifice the, the offering of the body of jesus christ through which we are saved once and for all it's that one sacrifice saved us to the uttermost so that no more sacrifice is required again so brothers and sisters that uh, is a, a very interesting uh, uh, mention here now after that we see one more instance where the children of israel were out in the wilderness and there something was involved there the birds were involved right you all remember the time in which they began to get fed up with the manna that they ate now manna every day they got manna but imagine eating that for breakfast and lunch and dinner and eating that they got so bored of it fed up of it so they started to complain against god they began to mourn and even weep and actually it's not wrong to ask for other things better things but they had to realize that they were on a journey and they had to adjust with what was given them because they are going to the promised land and they will enjoy everything there so they had to put up with this and the way to ask also was very wrong and they began to complain and even regret that god brought them out of egypt and they began to think of egypt and what all they ate there and the fishes and the onions and and all that spicy things they ate in egypt and they began to ask question god why god saved them from that land of egypt no then god was so angry and then god said i will give them meat they asked for meat and god said you will have meat you see that in numbers chapter 11 18 to 20 and then verses 31 to 34 there's so much but we'll read uh, a few verses here numbers chapter 11 verses 18 and say thou unto the people sanctify yourself against tomorrow and you shall eat flesh for you have wept in the ears of the lord saying who will give us flesh to eat for it was well with us in egypt therefore the lord will give you flesh and you shall eat you shall eat not one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days but even a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils it will be lord summon to you because thou have despised the lord which is among you and you have wept before him you see and said why have we come out of egypt you see they lusted after meat god said i'll give you so much meat that you will get you see lots some of it so god sent these birds this we call them quails you know, small birds they are and uh, like chicken they began to come and fall so low that they filled the places so that they began to gather it and and eat it for one full month daily they were eating it they 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 cut it and and they dried it in the sun and they were eating it eating it and until you know god's anger was kindled against them and in verse 31 and while the flesh was yet between their teeth before it was cured the wrath of the lord was kindled against the people and the lord smote the people with a very great plague and he called the name of the place kibroth hath because there they buried the people that lusted you see so that's the story there you see what we can learn from this the quails they began to crave for food weep for food food was everything so there we have to understand that you see we are also journeying in the wilderness god has saved us from egypt and taking us to canaan from this wicked world god has saved us and is taking us to our heavenly canaan but meanwhile we are passing through this wilderness and during that time we should not murmur or complain we should not look back to our old lives and think how we were happy 
We should not lust after meat. Meat means the fleshly desires of our heart. They were looking back at what they lost, at the pleasures. They were lusting after meat. So that's what we should learn. We should not give in to fleshly desires now. We should be content with what God has given us. We should not envy the world. We have given that up and we are going to a better world. And meanwhile, as we are going, this is a journey and the journey will be difficult. No journey, however, luxurious class we may travel, yet it is difficult. And we are not traveling in luxurious class also. It is promised, it is prophesied that those who are godly in Christ will suffer tribulation. If you are godly, you will suffer tribulation. That is, the Bible already declares that. And therefore, our Lord also said, take up your cross and follow me. As our Lord suffered, we also have to suffer. So let us not be greedy and be lustful as the people of Israel. And as they were so lustful, God let them enjoy for a while, but sent in his plague and they were all destroyed and, and they never made it to the land of promise. So let us not be greedy. Let us not go after our fleshly desires. On the contrary, let us mortify the desires of the flesh. Let us be happy with the manna, whatever needs, basic needs our Lord is giving us. The heavenly hope that he has given us, his, his wonderful words to encourage us. And let us finish our journey and so that we may enter the promised land. So that's what we can learn from this very instance. Well, we come to number seven and, and this is the most popular answer I got. Many people, they, they remember this more than anything else. That is the talking donkey. You see, Balaam's talking donkey. But also like the talking serpent, this talking donkey is very, very unusual. Now we know that donkey talking on the internet, if you should see, you know, it is like you know, the same sound, it can make only one type of sound. And that sound will be loud or a low noise, it may be fast or slow, but it is only one thing it can do, that one particular sound only it can make. But here it is talking in human language and talking very logically <laughs> and reasonably here. And that is amazing. We see that in the same book, Numbers chapter 22, verses 22. Now, we know Balaam. Balaam was uh, a prophet. We know about him, how that Balak, the Moabite king, tried to hire him to curse the people of Israel. Now, as Israel was passing through uh, this land of Moab, Balak was very frightened and he wanted this prophet Balaam to go and put a curse on them. And uh, God said to Balaam not to go. Because people of Israel were his people and God says, you should not go. And Balaam will say, will not go. But when Balak, the king, offers him more money, you see, more reward, that will change his mind. And he will saddle up his donkey and start going there in order to curse Israel. And that is when this happened. And that's when as he was traveling, what do we read here in, in verse 22, chapter 22, verse 22. And Lord's anger was kindled because he went and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon an ass, and his two servants were with him. And he saw the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and the sword in his hand. So the angel is standing right on the way. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn it back into the way. So Balaam couldn't see the angel of the robber. Ass could see. Now some say animals can see demons. Maybe, you see, sometimes you see the dogs howling and barking at almost nothing. <laughs> and maybe uh, that's possible. And uh, now that's what happened here. And he didn't see it and he began to beat the donkey. And verse 24, And the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards 
a well-being on this side and the wall on that side, I mean a wall on this side and on that side, and when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself to the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall and he smote her again. So the, there was a wall on either side and, and in order to escape, you know, it went to the side of the wall and Balaam got hurt and he got angry and again he started beating the ass the second time. And verse 6, 26. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way either to the right or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, he fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was so kindled and he smote the ass with his staff. So he started beating because the, it stopped and it, it wouldn't get up. You see. And verse 28, that's the interesting part here. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass and she said to Balaam, see, the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? Now imagine that animals speaking out in human language. Now normally we say if animals could speak, what they would say? We have so many animals, you know, Husky dogs sing, I love you, and, and many uh, parrots also speaking. You know. they, they're just repeating what is taught them. You know. You know, they, 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 they train it in such a way that uh, they, they, they repeat it. You know, they, they don't intelligently make up a conversation. You know, parrots also, they just keep repeating sometimes, you know. Uh, but here, the donkey understands the situation. It is talking logic there. And it's, and it's questioning his action. Means this, the, it, it, it has a sense of justice there. You see, it's asking, why have you smitten me these three times? And verse 29, And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there wear a sword in my hand, and now I would have killed thee. Now, this is so funny here. The donkey is talking, the ass is talking, and so wonderful it is. Never has animal spoken like this, and this is so shocking it must have been, and so surprising. But rather, Balaam is casually answering it. I say, replying and saying, you have mocked me. If I had a sword, I will kill you. Just imagine this. Will anyone kill a talking donkey? <laughs> but this Balaam was so angry that he was started responding to donkey. And then the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass upon whom thou hast ridden ever since I was thine to this day? Was I ever to do unto thee like this? And he said, No. Have I ever behaved like this? And see, the uh, donkey reasoning with him. Now, all this is not possible and no, it is actually God who is speaking. The angel of the Lord who is speaking through donkey. Just like Satan spoke through serpent to Mother Eve. That is what we should understand. Otherwise an animal cannot reason like this. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and with his sword drawn in his hand and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. Then his eyes are opened and he sees you see, understands why this ass is behaving like this. Now, brothers and sisters, anyway, from this talking donkey, what we can learn? Sometimes, when we are going in the wrong path, things might happen which is against us, but those things will be actually saving us from more harm. Just like here, this donkey, you see, giving him trouble and and making him hurt his feet and all this. But actually the donkey saved his life. That's what the angel says here. But for the donkey, you would have been a dead man. I would have killed you. So the donkey is actually saving Balaam's life. These three, three times. Because it went away from the path of the angel with the sword in his hand. So, so many things that happen to us, you know. Maybe something bad has happened, but... But God may be saving us from something worse that we have to realize. Especially when we are going in the wrong path. Especially when we are going in the wrong way. 
against the will of the Lord, like Balaam. We read about the way of Cain and way of Balaam in the Bible, in the New Testament. He went in the way after that reward, unrighteous reward. He was greedy, so that he's going against God's will. At that time, God is putting blocks on his way because God still wanted to save his life. You see, so sometimes things can happen to us that will be actually blessings in disguise, which will be actually saving us from greater harm. We have to understand that. And secondly, a donkey talking here, we can understand from this is that God can use anybody to talk to us. Of course, God speaks to us through the preaching of the word of God in the church. God speaks to us through pastors and so many people. But God can speak to us through anybody. God can speak to an unconsecrated person also. Maybe an, a man who doesn't know God. God may still speak to you sometimes, especially when you're going the wrong way, to warn you. God may speak through your servant. You say, how many times it has happened like that in the Bible? So God can speak through anybody. If he could speak through a donkey, he can speak through anybody. That we have to realize. Main thing is we have to give heed to what is being said to us. Sometimes even our enemies, the, the critics, you see, the, the bad things they say, we have to consider and think whether that, that has something there for us to learn from. So like that, brothers and sisters, when I'm saying this, I remember one instance in which, you know, one servant of God who is an evangelist, even now many years ago, he said what happened in his life. He said even then he was an evangelist and uh, was a Christian and... Uh, and serving the Lord in his own independent way. And that time, there was one particular relative of his who was troubling him so much, he was so angry with that man, that he decided to do something against him. And he went to that city where that man was, and he hired some goons to attack him. He said he paid money and was waiting for that it's relative to pass by so that they will chop him up. You know, that, that, uh, to that extent he was angry on that person. And then as they were waiting, it seems, that rowdy, that goon, that, that hired killer whom he has paid money to do this job, suddenly he said, it seems, Sir, you say you are a Christian and uh, think whether you really want to do this or what. You know? Just imagine an unconsecrated, a killer who works for just for money, all his interest is his money, but he is telling him whether he really has to do this thing, especially because he's a Christian, you know, is it right on his part to do this thing? And this man, he says, at that point I realized, I felt like somebody's smiting on my face. And then I realized and I stopped that and I, I came back home and so many years later he's so thankful for that man speaking up because, because not only that it would have landed him in jail but it would have been a, such a big mark on his character doing such a thing. So like that you know, God can speak through people, others also. That's what we can understand from this instance of the talking donkey. Well, brothers and sisters, finally we come to one more point, the eighth point, and then we finish for this class, and then we continue in our next class. So that is also a very popular, you know, answer normally given. Name some instance of people with animal, then the name that comes up is Samson. And Samson and the lions, they say. Samson killed a lion. Now that is not a remarkable, I mean, it's very remarkable, but... Uh, there is not much to learn from that other than to know that he had the spirit of God and he was able to do this great thing. But David also killed a lion and, and in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 11.22 we read Benaiah also killed a lion. But something else is there, some other instance in Samson's life where an animal was involved. And, and that of course we know is in Judges chapter 15. In, in Judges chapter 15, we know that Samson, so many things that he did was wrong. 
you know, he went out and married a Philistine woman. And later on, he was away for some time and when he went back to see her, that father-in-law had given his wife in marriage to some other man. And he says, you take my second daughter. She is also fair done. Now that was how it was in those days. And Samson was very angry and, and all his actions made him angry against the Philistines and the Philistines were the enemies of Israel. And so when he fell on Philistines and destroyed them, he was destroying the enemies of Israel. That's how God used Samson. So God used Samson. We know Samson was a special chosen person. He was a Nazarite. All that we know. And he had to follow some disciplines in his life. He, he cannot live like anyone else. But still, what we see here is when this incident happened in, in this chapter, verse 15, you know, chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, you know, what he did was, he wanted to punish these Philistines in some way. And what he did was very remarkable here. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took fire bands and turned tail to tail and put a fire band in the midst of, between the two tails. And when he had set brands of fire, he let them into the standing corn and Philistines of the Philistines and burnt up both the stocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. You see. So what he did was he, we read, he, he caught 300 foxes. He tied the tails and put firebrand and he let them loose among the fields and so he burnt up everything. So it was a big loss for the Philistines. Now, there are some passages in the Bible when you read, you really wonder whether this is really practically possible or what. And this passage is one of them. And when you read, he caught 300 foxes. Now, we think, is, is it really possible to catch foxes like that? Now, if you had any experience with fox, and I had myself, you know how difficult it is to catch one fox. We were in a huge open place, you know, in which one day I was in my walk and with my dog. We had a big dog. And uh, it spotted a fox. And the fox started running and my dog started to chase it. Now dogs are bigger animals and they can run faster than the fox. And right as it was chasing and right when it was so close almost to catch it, the fox suddenly changed the route. And so much so that the, our dog went straight ahead and so far it went until it took a U-turn and come back and again started running after the fox. And again the same thing the fox did. Right when it was about to be caught, it changed the direction. Suddenly changed the direction and then it escaped. And uh, I was thinking, you know, fox, they say we, fox are very cunning, you know. I, I, re, I saw it uh, first hand. How it can escape, you know, capturing. So... If that was so difficult for my dog to catch, you know how Samson caught 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail. And these foxes, they bite also, you know, they won't let you catch the tail and tie it. Now, of course, Samson was a special man. He had the spirit of God upon him and he could do so many things. But, but still, this looks like practical. And, and I was wondering until, you know, I came across a news bulletin in, in some uh, country, I don't remember, where foxes are caught for the fur. So many foxes are caught, just they, they skin out the fox and they, they take the, the rest of the body of the fox in lorries, you know, full load of bodies of foxes. They take it in the lorry, in the trucks, and they dump it like a huge pile of dead bodies of donkeys. So many thousands, like a, like a mountain. So many foxes they, they kill for the sake of the fur. So, and then I saw, then there is actually some ways to catch this so many number of foxes. They, they, the foxes like some certain food. And there are so many foxes in certain areas. And they put that food and, and trap them. So that these foxes come in hundreds and they, they come there and they just put a net or something and they catch it. So some, some tactic uh, Samson must have done. You know, after seeing that uh, news clipping, then I was able to believe this. It, is, it can be possible and, 
and somehow he did it with uh, the extra power from god of course uh, help from god and uh, and that's what happened now from this what we can learn what we can learn is that samson was being used by god in so many ways the people of god and the people of israel they had enemies and god had to destroy them and he was using samson and samson was doing so many things that was in favor for the people of israel but at the same time he did not justify his actions just because he was anointed by god just because the spirit of god came upon him that doesn't justify his actions because we see in the Sam, uh, about samson he used to go out after this uh, other women gentile women and and delilah these were not good women you know they were not the proper wife yet he went to these women and he did all these things wrong things still god was using him but ultimately it cost him his life and we know the story in the same chapter we read how delilah wanted to find out the secret of his strength no secret of his strength you know unlike what many think you know in movies also they 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 show samson as a huge person with lot of muscle and all that the fact was far from it samson was a very ordinary looking person and that's why the philistines wanted to know the secret of his strength if he was very tall and strong and muscular they would have said you know he's so strong a big man so he is able to do this no he was a very ordinary looking normal guy yet he was able to do this tremendous feats which got that uh, curiosity among them to know the secret and we know the secret was is in his hair you know he should not cut his hair and uh, how they put a honey trap for him they sent delilah and and used delilah to get the secret out and and finally he said the secret and his hair was cut and he lost the spirit of god of course in the end he came back and he did a, a wonderful feat for uh, the people of israel he killed the enemies of uh, israel but he also got killed before that his eyes were gouged out and he became a slave and all that because of his action so what we can learn from this samson is that just because god is using us just because we have the anointing of god upon us it doesn't justify whatever we do so we will still have to face judgment that is what we have to realize so we have to realize that samson was having this great opportunity to do wonderful things yet because of his own weaknesses he lost greater opportunities and finally he lost his life also so what we should learn from that is very obvious uh, brothers and sisters so these eight things we have seen today and there are almost 25 of them and god willing we will take up next class and we have to go a little faster and meanwhile you see if all the things that i mentioned is not on a list and there's some more you can write it down and uh, maybe you want to uh, send a text message to me on our uh, whatsapp you can do that and it's an interesting thing actually to think and and if you're not able to come up with so many references you know you maybe it's time for you to go back to the bible and start reading the bible all over again so as to refresh your memory anyway i feel that this was a blessing and uh, god willing we will continue this in our next class thank you